Well, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're having a good day on this beautiful spring Charlotte Sabbath. Uh, we do have spring here, which is kind of nice to see. It is a pleasure to be back in Charlotte after being out of town a few weeks. <clears throat> it's nice to, uh, always nice to come back home. As we begin today, uh, the sermon portion, I'd like to ask you a question. The question is, can you fail well? Can you fail well? Now that might sound like a strange question, I know, but let me explain. There's actually quite an art to failing well. It's harder than you might think. Anyone can fail miserably, but to fail well is a different matter. Can you fail well? Okay, now before I totally confuse you, let me give you a definition. What does it mean to fail? <clears throat> what is the definition of failure? I looked on an online dictionary. You know, the web, of course, is the source of all information. So I looked to the web. Where does the definition of failure come? Well, there were several interesting definitions that I found pertinent to our discussion, I think. Number one, the condition or fact of not achieving the desired end or ends. Number two, the condition or fact of being insufficient or falling short. Number three, non-performance of what is requested or expected, omission. Number four, the act or fact of failing to pass a course or test or assignment. Now, I think it's safe to say, wouldn't you, that, that all of us at some point in our lives, and probably uh, numerous times, are going to have to deal with failure. We may not achieve the desired end or ends of some goal that we have, or our efforts are maybe insufficient or fall short in some way. Or we do not perform at the level requested or expected. Or we may fail to pass a course or a test or an assignment at school. The point is, from time to time, we all experience setbacks in life. When that happens, how well do we handle it? How well do we handle it? You know, when I was in high school, one of our coaches one time told us, about the best way to fall. Have you ever heard about the best way to fall? I had never known that there was a good way to fall before that. But he said, there is a good way and a bad way to fall. And he said, the good way to fall is not to reach out your arms and try to break your fall. You might wind up breaking your arm or your wrist. But rather, when you feel yourself falling, to tuck your shoulder, your elbow, and roll. That's the way to fall. So as coincidence would have it, I had an opportunity to test that theory not long after that. <laughs> and we were out on the basketball court, and uh, this was outside, and gravel all around, and, and concrete courts, a very non-conducive surface for falling. And we were running a fast break, and somehow I tripped or something, and I began to fall. And immediately through my mind, I, I, I thought, I'm going to test this new theory. So instead of reaching out and trying to break my fall, I tucked my shoulder <clears throat> and I rolled. And you know, like that, I rolled and I was up. And I thought, wow, that actually worked pretty good. I didn't scrape up my elbows. I didn't scrape up my, um, the front of my shirt and my, uh, my hands and everything. It worked. It's amazing the difference when you know how to fall well. It saves you from injury. Brethren, we're not on the basketball court. We are in the arena of life. And we're going to fall. We're going to make mistakes, have trials from time to time. The question is, how do we react to it? Will we grow from the experience? Will we bounce back? I recall reading what, something that General Patton once said. He said, it's not how far you fall, it's how high you bounce back. Think about it. You know, anyone who has tried to do anything significant winds up making their share of mistakes, right? 
Hammer and Hank Aaron, years ago, who was the home run king. Uh, at his, in his career, he had the, the record for the number of career home runs at 715. That was before Barry Bonds broke it, but that's disputed. Uh, you know, Hammer and Hank has the non-steroid home run record, <coughs> at least according to some. But Hank Aaron also had 2,297 runs batted in in his career. He also had 3,771 career hits. Pretty impressive. Did you know how many times he struck out? 1,383 times. Now, if you've ever played baseball, one time is enough, isn't it, <laughs> to strike out? Imagine if Hank Aaron had at any point in time after he struck out said, you know, this is not for me. He didn't stop trying. The key is, what do we do with it when we stumble, when we have setbacks? I think as we near the Passover, it's interesting to think about some very profound lessons that we can learn about this, about handling disappointment, about handling mistakes, about dealing with problems, and the challenge that it is for us being humans and being Christians. You know, it's interesting, back in 31 AD, the last Passover, as that Passover was approaching, the last Passover that Christ kept with his disciples, there were some very interesting things happening. It's helpful, I think, for us to consider as we are approaching the Passover. <clears throat> the disciples had been taught by him for three and a half years. They were excited to be a part of the core group of followers of the Messiah. They knew who he was. They knew, apparently, uh, that he was the promised one, that he was going to lead Israel as their king. In fact, let's notice a couple of scriptures, Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, Isaiah chapter 2, and verse 2, we get a little bit of background about what it would have been like to be one of the followers of Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse Verse 2, it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. You know, we read this, and, and we all know this is talking about the millennium, right? It's talking about a time yet future. But think about it. As the disciples were reading these same scriptures, who were they applying it to? What time period were they applying it to? Well, their lifetimes. Jesus Christ, who was with them. It formed a mental picture. It formed an expectation. He said in verse 3, and many people shall go uh, and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Uh, verse 4, and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Can you imagine being one of the disciples of Christ and reading this and thinking, wow, this is going to happen? The man that we are listening to and learning from is going to make this happen. And as events unfolded, they were more and more excited about this taking place. Isaiah chapter 11. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 11. Another scripture that they, they might have read. And they were not thinking about a, a millennium 2,000 years away. They were thinking about something that would happen in their lifetime. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, 
the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Wow. Just imagine the mental picture they were forming as they followed this man who was the Messiah who these scriptures were pointing to. What were they thinking? He said, verse 9, When this Messiah would come, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow, this is going to spread until it's all over the whole world. Can you see the mental image that was forming in their mind? Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Nothing's going to stop it. This is sure. Now again, as we read these and we look back and say, well, of course, it wasn't yet for their time <laughs> because we know the end of the story, but they didn't. That's the backstory leading up to the last Passover of Christ's life. Let's now go to John chapter 13, because we find in John chapter 13 some very interesting things happening. <clears throat> John chapter 13, in verse 1, Jesus told them he was going to suffer. Jesus told them and, 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 and tried to clue them in about some of the things that were going to happen, but they didn't understand yet. John chapter 13 and verse, uh, verse 1. Oops, <clears throat> wrong book here. John chapter 13 and verse, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he arose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. Now we know the story, then he uh, initiated the Institute of the Foot Washing, which, <clears throat> which we will do, Passover evening. Verse 20. He said, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that receives whomsoever I send receives me, and he that receives me receives him that sent me. And when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, verily, verily, I say to you, that one of you shall betray me. And of course, we understand that they looked around, doubting of whom he spoke, and they were very troubled, the disciples, thinking about what? Is he talking about? Who is he talking about? How could that possibly be? We've read all these scriptures in Isaiah. We've read all how this is going to happen in the end. We've, we, we've seen how it's going to just spread, and he's going to overthrow the Romans, and everything's going to be great, and we're going to be a part of it. What's he talking about? Verse 26, Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him, then said Jesus to him, what you do, do it quickly. Let's get it over with. Verse 30, he then, uh, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Judas went out 
As we know, he had already conspired with the priests to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and now he was going out to do the deed. Now, who knows why he did this? We don't really know. But some have speculated that perhaps Judas wanted to force Jesus to declare himself as the king and fight and overflow, overthrow the Romans. Um, perhaps he was impatient that Jesus hadn't done it already. <clears throat> At any rate, he was about to betray the Messiah. Back in the room with Jesus and the disciples, we continue. He continued to address his, his disciples, explaining, starting to explain that he was going to go away. That things as they accepted and, and as expected were not exactly going to be. It said in verse 36, Then Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, Where I go, you cannot follow now, but you shall follow me afterwards. And Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say to you, the cock shall not crow until you have denied me three times. <clears throat> you know, put yourself in Peter's shoes now, okay? You know, we read Isaiah 2, we read Isaiah 9, we read Isaiah 11. Those are just a few of the millennial scriptures. And Peter must have been thinking, you know, something's not right here. It's not adding up. It's not making sense. This isn't the plan. You know, after all, he, Jesus was supposed to be setting up a kingdom and throwing out the Romans, and we're going to be a part of it. But, you know, no matter, he may have assumed, no matter, I will protect him. I, yeah, he says, I'm going to die. Well, I'll protect him. I know what I can do. I know myself. After all, I'm, I'm a man of action. You know, I can, I can take anybody out. Little did he know. He really didn't know what to do. And in a short while, <clears throat> he would deny the Messiah. You know what happened? They went into the garden. Uh, Judas came with the guards and the priests, and they began to arrest uh, Jesus. Peter took out his sword. He whacked at one of the servants of the high priest, cut off his ear. He may have been thinking, okay, this is it. This is it. We've been waiting. Now this is it. The time has come. Jesus is going to, is going to set up his kingdom finally. And what did Christ do? He said, Peter, put it away. He reached down and picked up an ear, and he put it back on Malchus's head and healed it. And then he allowed himself to be handcuffed or tied, arrested and taken away. Let's read what happened next. Luke chapter 22. What was Peter thinking at that point? Luke 22 and verse 51. <clears throat> then they took him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them and a certain maid held, beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him. Men said, This man was also with him. And he denied it, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You all art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after, another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what you say. And immediately while he yet spoke, the cock crew, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine that look? When Jesus looked at Peter, and suddenly it all came flooding back. I did what exactly what he said I was going to do. It 
It says, he went out and wept bitterly. You know, <clears throat> I think it was too much to process. Think about just what had happened in a couple of hours, in a few hours, a short few hours. Peter had gone from absolute confidence, really overestimating his abilities, but absolute confidence and having expectations that were realistic to him, but not reality. Made sense to him, were scriptural, you know, he just got about 2,000 years off on the time frame. And then he became absolutely shocked when reality came crashing down and it blew his world apart in every direction. And then he was horrified to see what he himself personally was capable of doing. Denying his master, whom he said he would die for. It was overwhelming. And he went out bitterly and, and wept. Now let's pick up the story of Judas. Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. What happened next? When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. Now, <clears throat> Judas didn't just deny Christ. He purposely betrayed him. He was a thief. He committed a crime. He, in his greed, in his envy, perhaps, whatever, um, he actually purposely betrayed him. But, you know, if he had thought that Jesus would fight back and would take the throne by force. Think about it. His expectations were also shattered, just like Peter. His mental image of what was going to happen was destroyed. He overestimated his ability to control events and to maneuver events down a certain path. And he was also shocked when it didn't materialize, right? And he was horrified when he came face to face with what he had done. So both of these men, Peter and Judas, came, I think it's safe to say, to the lowest point in their lives. Now again, we're, they're not exactly parallel. Judas betrayed Christ and Peter, in weakness, denied him. But the point is, both of them came to the lowest point in their lives. And now they had a choice to make. They had to make a decision. What would they do? You know, brethren, we have that same decision every time we fall down. Sometimes our problems are big. Sometimes they're small. Sometimes they're significant. Sometimes, maybe to others, they may not seem significant. The point is, big or small, we have to make a choice. Every time we have a setback. How good are we at handling setbacks in a positive way. Because Peter and Judas took diametrically opposite paths, didn't they? When we know the rest of the story. We know their stories. They've been written down. They've been told and retold to hundreds and thousands and millions of people. As examples, what did Judas do? <clears throat> Again, verse 3. When he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver, said, I have sinned, I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See you to it. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed, and he went and hanged himself. He was devastated and he took his life. On the other hand, Peter was remorseful. Peter was overcome with sorrow with what he had done. 
But Peter went away to think about it, to think through it, to deal with it, to learn from it, and resolve to understand and grow through it. And he became a powerful leader in the New Testament church. Brethren, which path do we take? That's the point. Because it is a definite choice we have to make. And it's a skill that we can grow in. How do we handle defeat? Can we bounce back? Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, because it's inevitable that we're going to have setbacks. It's inevitable that we're going to make mistakes, that we're going to have problems. What are we going to do? It's actually quite an important skill to develop to be able to bounce back from adversity. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 8. Remember the story how the fornicator had been cast out and uh, then had repented and, and had been brought back. And Paul was explaining about the difference between the two types of uh, repentance. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse, uh, verse 8, he says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle has made you sorry. He's now talking about the, the, the church needing to, to repent for, for their uh, response to the, the fornicator when he came back. I perceive that the same epistle has made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world works death. For behold, this selfsame thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yes, what clearing of yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what vehement desire. What zeal, what revenge in all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. There is a right way to deal with problems and mistakes, big and little, isn't there? Peter did it right. <clears throat> and I think there's a lesson for all of us, even to this day. Brethren, how can we learn from adversity and how can we grow from the trials that are inevitable, big or small. I think there are several things that, that helped Peter to make the right choice on that awful day, really, the worst day of his life back there. Number one, we're going to talk about several. Number one, I think several understandings that Peter came to. <clears throat> Number one, problems are a part of life. Problems are a part of life. Mistakes will happen. Bad things will happen. We can't get away from it. We're still human. And you know, the sooner we admit that we're human and we're going to have problems, the sooner we can actually deal with them instead of denying them or running away from them. Let's turn over to John chapter 16 and verse 31. Problems are a part of life. <clears throat> John chapter 16 and verse 31. Look at what Jesus told his disciples here. John 16, 31. Jesus answered them and said, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour comes, yes, is now come, that you shall be scattered every man to his own and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You're going to have problems. Don't be unrealistic, he said. <laughs> Don't be shocked. We all know that. And yet, what's the first thing when we have a problem? Ah! Why did that happen to me? Right? And we're shocked. And yet, Christ said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. Sometimes it's our own doing, admittedly. Sometimes it's circumstances. 
Sometimes it's because we have an enemy who is trying to destroy God's people. Notice John chapter 15 and verse 18. John chapter 15 and verse, verse 18. Christ said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying... They will also keep yours. John chapter 16 and verse 1. He said, These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. Understand, he said, bad things are going to happen. But I don't want you to be blown away. This is what Jesus was telling his disciples. The last night of his life. These things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Verse 2, <clears throat> they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time comes that whosoever kills you will think that he does God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. He warned them. <clears throat> you know, we don't have significant persecution today like they did in the first century. Undoubtedly, it will increase before it's all over. But even today, Satan the devil knows who we are. He knows where we are. He is circling the camp to pick off whom he can. God allows him to do it, to be circling the camp, but he will not leave us alone or defenseless against our adversary. Simply knowing that our lives are not going to be a bed of roses, there will be difficulties. You know, I think it helps us to prepare ourselves for the times when we fall down. You know, in the United States, <clears throat> we are starting to feel the pinch of the economy as it, as it weakens. Many brethren overseas have, have known this feeling for some time, haven't they? You know, our brethren in the Philippines uh, have gone through very difficult times economically for a long time, uh, often hit by disasters and, and storms that ravage the country. And yet, you know, one of the things that has struck my wife and I in getting to know the Filipino brethren is that they respond cheerfully to calamity. Mr. League and Mrs. League also know the brethren very well. You know, it, it's amazing um, how, how they're able to, to respond with a smile in very difficult circumstances. It doesn't mean it's easy, but they've learned to be able to handle it, to handle it gracefully. It's a part of life to grin and bear it. Our brethren in Haiti were hit with this horrible earthquake, you know, about a year ago. But, you know, they were suffering well before the earthquake. Life was pretty hard before that, too. And so many of our brethren, <clears throat> problems, very, very difficult problems are a way of life. We have our own problems. The point is running from them. Denying them, you know, sometimes putting our head in, in the sand does not make them go away, does it? Problems are a part of life. Sometimes one problem can lead to another if we're not careful. You know, if you're in a basketball game and when a player gets a foul, <clears throat> what's the most likely thing that will happen in the next 60 seconds? He'll get another foul. That's called the frustration foul. The, the, the foul that you're frustrated about the first foul, you know? And what happens if the coach leaves you in for another 30 seconds? You're going to get a third foul. And now you have three fouls in a, about a minute and a half. Well, what happens to us sometimes? Well, <clears throat> sometimes something bad happens, and instead of digging in and getting our attitude straight and getting focused on God, we, we sometimes plow ahead and compound the problem. 
Mr. De Gea in the Philippines used to say, you problem the problem. You first had one problem, now you have two problems. And the second problem didn't solve the first problem, you know. There's an article that I found from a website, 48 Hours, <clears throat> that told this story, talking about this. It said, losing a job can lead to anger, resentment, guilt, and depression. I once worked with a gentleman who, having lost his job, tried to reposition himself and do a job search, only to become discouraged after just a few days with no success. Then he started hiding out from his wife, pretending to be doing a job search, while in reality he was going to the library to surf the internet and read magazines. He consoled himself in fast food and high sugar snacks and quickly added about 25 pounds. He was probably the problem. Adding problems <clears throat> didn't solve the first. This, in turn, made him self-conscious about his weight and ill-fitting clothes. The story is not unusual. <clears throat> New research confirms that losing a job can put people at an elevated risk for emotional and physical problems. Unemployment, unemployment can start a vicious cycle of depression, loss of personal discipline, and decreased emotional health, failure in a business, the dissolution of a relationship, a breakdown of health, or a financial disaster can also be a setup for these negative self-defeating feelings. Any of these situations can make a person a candidate for the downward spiral of anger, resentment, guilt, and depression. Brethren, when we suffer a setback, <clears throat> oftentimes the problem, if we're not careful, leads to other problems in our life. We can't allow that when we read this story of Peter and the Passover in 31 AD. You know, I think we can gain great solace from the fact that this man who actually denied the Savior, denied the Messiah, was encouraged by that same master, the master who knew that he would fall down, and yet the master who said, Peter, it's just a mistake. It's just a mistake. You can bounce back. Brethren, are we learning the skill of bouncing back from setbacks? Number one, by simply admitting we will have problems. Number two, number two, I think another skill that Peter came to realize was being pruned does not mean being rejected. Being pruned does not mean being rejected. Now, what does this mean? Let's turn over to Luke chapter or rather, John chapter 15. <clears throat> John chapter 15, some more instruction that Jesus gave on the night he was betrayed. Verse 1, he said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. You know, we were talking about problems and tribulations before. Mr. Stroud talked about that in the sermonette, Mr. League as well. But now we're talking about the reasons why God allows those problems to occur so that we can be corrected and molded and shaped and pruned. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. What is God looking for? For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. You know, sometimes I think our discouragement is caused by the fact that we get pruning and rejecting mixed up. Now the problem is, you know, it does hurt when God prunes us, when he comes at us with the pruning hooks. You know, you can see him coming. <laughs> And you can see the pruning hooks, and they hurt, and they cause us to bleed and ache, and it doesn't feel good, and we think he doesn't like us. 
and we think he's left us. He wouldn't hurt us if he liked us, right? We're confusing pruning with being rejected. <clears throat> but God is not in the business of rejecting anyone, as long as we are willing to be conquered and molded by him. I have some fruit trees at home. I know some of you grow fruit trees and uh, some that I've been working on for several years. And when you, you plant fruit trees and you watch them grow, you know, you're excited every time you walk by them. You're looking for more growth and you're thinking, wow, how much, how much more fruit are they going to have this year? Or the, the, the new limbs and the new tree, the new leaves. And, and it's exciting. It's wonderful to see uh, when they're healthy and strong and bursting with life. And it makes you sad when they aren't. And you do everything you possibly can to, to help them to grow. And I, I have this peach tree that uh, hasn't done well. <clears throat> and uh, after about three years, it was about the same size as when I planted it. It might have even shrunk a little bit. <laughs> and um, so I decided, okay, I'm going to take the advice of, of the parable. I'm going to dig around it. I'm going to dung it. I'm going to put some more fertilizer in it. I'm going to keep working with it. Another year passed, no growth. And this spring came along. And you know, I walked out a couple of weeks ago and I was walking up to the tree and I looked at it and I felt one of its limbs and it was brittle and just snapped off. And I thought, well, let me try another one. And that one was brittle. And another one was brittle. And another one was brittle. You know, I think it's over for that tree. <laughs> I, I don't think I can resuscitate it. But it breaks my heart, you know. It makes me sad. Now you think if a human being can get so attached to a peach tree, <laughs> brethren, how does God feel about us? Is he really going to throw us away because of a mistake or a problem or a trial or a difficulty? I don't think so. <clears throat> you know, it's been a tremendous encouragement to meet so many brethren, and especially, it seems, the last year or two who have come back. After being not attending church services, for 15, or 20, or 25, or 30 years, being out in the wilderness. And yet God knew where they were. He didn't forget about them. They weren't lost. <clears throat> and I suspect there are more out there still. The game's not over, is it? Brethren, failure is not permanent unless we make it so. <laughs> Having a setback does not mean that God has rejected us. Maybe he's just pruning us. You know, we work with our children that way. We don't let them grow like weeds in the garden. You know, we pull the weeds out. We try to help them to learn self-control. We try to help them to learn good habits. We teach them what the word no means, right? At least, you know, we should. <clears throat> Some today are not in, a mod in our modern world. There's an article here that uh, talks about that. It says, believing the fairy tale that frustration causes stress and poor self-esteem, some parents work hard to protect their children from this terrible scourge, the scourge of frustration. That's a terrible thing for children to experience, right, from time to time, frustration. Uh, I think we know better. The truth is, life involves many frustrations, and it's only through experience with frustration that we develop a tolerance for it. This enables us to turn adversity into challenge and persevere in the face of it. Perseverance, that all-important, if at first you don't succeed attitude, is the primary quality in every success story. So give your children regular doses of vitamin N. This vital nutrient is the most character-building two-letter word in the English language. No! To find out if you've given your children enough of this word, list on a sheet of paper everything you've ever dreamed of having. A sports car, a new house, jewelry. Now circle the things on your list you'll actually acquire within the next five years. Most of us content ourselves with 20% of what we desire. On the second sheet of paper, list everything your kids will ask for in the next 12 months. 
toys, electronic equipment, the latest clothes, movie tickets, etc. Then circle the things they're probably going to get. If you're a typical American, you circled 75% of your children's wish list. We accustom our children, the article concludes, to a material standard completely out of kilter with what they can expect as adults. Consider also that most of them attain this level of affluence not by working or sacrificing, but by whining, demanding, and manipulating. Brethren, do we ever whine and demand as children of God? Sometimes he gives us what we need and, and not just what we want. <clears throat> it says, we teach them that something can be had for nothing, one of the most destructive attitudes a person can acquire. So administer vitamin N. Give your children all they truly need, but only some, say 25% of what they simply want. You know, God allows us to face difficulties and have problems, doesn't he? And sometimes telling us no or wait or not right now or maybe is what he tells us. You know, I, I always hated that maybe when I was a kid. I mean, better yes or no, but maybe. I mean, it just leaves you in limbo. Maybe. Can I have no? Oh, maybe. Well, what do you mean maybe? When are you going to tell me the answer? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes God tells us maybe, doesn't he? You know, I think these are some lessons that Peter learned when he, in the lowest time of his life, as he went away and wept bitterly and he thought back to the words that Christ had just said, and they encouraged him and they helped him to cycle through this really hard time. Another lesson I think Peter learned as he thought about Christ's final teachings <clears throat> Number three, help is on the way. Help is on the way. <clears throat> you know, we love to watch westerns, and you know, it's, it's wonderful when help comes riding in and saves the day. But, you know, look at how many times Jesus talked about the help that they would have. <clears throat> John chapter 14 and verse 15. He said, John chapter 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, really should be it, but it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. You, one of the most powerful and meaningful promises that we have, that his presence, his spirit, which was surrounding them before conversion, before the day of Pentecost, and then would be actually in them, never to be without his presence. And that's amazing. Every time a, a new member of the body is baptized and receive God's spirit. What an incredible thing to have a part of God, not only with us and helping us, but actually in us. And the promise that we will never be alone if we are with him, if we don't leave him. That's what Jesus encouraged his disciples with just before he died. Verse 26 he said, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. Here he explained how it would, it would even be instrumental in, in helping them to remember all the things that he had taught them. It would all come flooding back. And not only that, they would understand it. All the things that maybe they heard the first time, but they didn't get when he was explaining to them, they would understand it. John chapter 15 and verse 26. <clears throat> John 15, verse 26, he said, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 16 and verse 12. 
John 16, verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. You, you can kind of imagine Jesus Christ as he was trying to explain things to these carnal men who, you know, they were trying, they were committed in, in as much as they could, but they didn't get it, a lot of it. And he was trying to say things that they did not understand. He said, you know what? There are things that you can't understand now, but they're going to come later. Verse 13. Verse 13, he says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. <clears throat> he will guide you into all truth. You know, yes, truth in doctrine, but also truth in in being able to look at ourselves. Truth in being able to face ourselves, right? That's some of the most difficult things to do as we see our own problems and shortcomings, as we examine ourselves in preparation for Passover and we judge ourselves and repent of things we need to repent. Peter was being told about the promise of the Spirit and I think that encouraged him as well in this worst day of his life. <clears throat> and when the time came, when the Holy Spirit was sent, think about it. God used him in an incredible way on the day of Pentecost to reach others. How do we handle adversity? We can handle it in a positive way as a springboard to growth and forward progress. Let's look at one more. Lastly, one more thing that Peter, I think, was also encouraged through and able to overcome because, number four, <clears throat> that is that God has big plans for us. Let's go back to John chapter 14 and verse 1. God has big plans for us. Look at some of the things that he told his disciples again that night. John chapter 14 and verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or offices or opportunities to be a part of the system and, and the government and the kingdom of God. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know, it's, it's really interesting <clears throat> that he was saying this right here, because when you look back in your Bible, just one verse before that was when Christ was telling Peter that he would deny him. Remember? Just one verse before now, so Christ knew that Peter was going to mess up and mess up big. Did he harangue him? Did he harass him? Did he endlessly, you know, beat on him for it? Or did he say, now, Peter, I know you're going to do this, but you know what? Part of how you're going to overcome from that mistake is I'm going to show you the future. I'm going to show you where you're going, Peter. I'm going to show you the kingdom of God, and I'm going to show you that I'm going to prepare a place, not just for everyone else, but for you too. You know, sometimes as we're working through difficulties and problems and trials, Yes, we need to be introspective. Yes, we need to examine. Yes, we need to figure it out. But sometimes we just need to get our eyes on the future and on the big picture and on where we're going. And that's what helps us to be motivated and to grow and overcome. Verse 11. <clears throat> He said, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Not only, Peter and disciples, not only can you be a part of something big, but guess what? Your work is going to be even bigger than the work that I've done. And what did the apostles do? Well, Jesus went through the land of, land of Israel at that time and, and, and parts of, of uh, the extremities. But the apostles went all over the Roman world, didn't they? Greater works than these you will do, didn't we? John 15 and verse 14. Okay. He said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He told them, I have specifically chosen you. I've got a job for you. You know, doesn't that feel good when someone comes to you and says, you know, I think that there's something that needs to be done and you would be perfect for it. That's what Jesus was telling the disciples. You are handpicked. <clears throat> I have big plans for you. You know, it's interesting, too, that Jesus was not just trying to shoot the moon with no hope of hitting it. You know, uh, having his heads in the clouds, uh, having dreams that were just totally unrealistic, that's kind of the expectation that Peter had, if you think about it. You know, Christ was going to be the king over all the world, but Peter would be the instrument through which it would happen. If you think about it, he was going to be the one protecting Christ, right? He was going to be the one protecting the Messiah. So really, Peter would bring about the kingdom of God on earth. He had big ideas, but they were totally beyond reality because it was all on his own power. He couldn't fight the spiritual battles that he was up against on his own but he was dreaming he could. You know, <clears throat> our culture and our society has really done a disservice to us and to our young people in telling them you can be anything you want. And yet you hear that all the time, don't you? You know, that's not really true. Not everybody has the same opportunities. Not everybody has the same talents or abilities. There are some people that can run fast and some people that can't. I was in high school and I was in track and I worked just as hard as everybody else on the team. I sweated, I pushed myself, I watched what I ate. You know, I trained and I would go as fast as my legs would carry me, and these other guys would just whoosh, go right by me. <laughs> they could fly. You know, I could have set as a lifetime goal to be a world-class runner, but it would have been a totally unrealistic goal. Brethren, we set up our children for great disappointment and stumbling blocks when we don't teach them to set realistic goals that are in line with their talents and their abilities and their opportunities. Or sometimes the goal is attainable but just needs to be broken down into doable steps, not a, not a mountain all at once. There's a recent article that explains how some teens today feel hopeless because they've lost the faith, they don't have the faith in, in, in achieving their goals. <clears throat> it says this, 13-year-old Jackson Sykes has been struggling for years to raise his scores in math. When he got a 33% last year on fractions, Jackson said, I didn't know how I was ever going to learn them. Battling his homework just made him frustrated, says his mother Linda of Gilmer, Texas. Jackson's teachers proposed a solution. They taught him to trim his goal into smaller steps and try improving his scores just a little from test to test. 
Gradually, he raised his results to 90%. I take those little steps, then I just keep stepping, he said. A student's ability to set and achieve realistic goals is linked to higher grades, lower college dropout rates, and greater well-being in adulthood. In a recent study in the Journal of Applied Psychology, college, college students who completed an intensive written exercise identifying their goals and mapping out steps to reach them posted a significant increase in grades and credits earned compared with other students. Yet a majority of U.S. students lack faith in their ability to reach their goals, according to a nationally representative survey. In other words, when they have setbacks, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do with disappointment and adversity. <clears throat> Even when students cling to lofty ambitions, they often set themselves up for failure by not aligning the behavior with their goals, says Dominique Morisano an assistant professor of clinical psychology at Columbia University. They might say, I want to be a pediatrician, but they're not attending school. They're using drugs. They're not taking care of themselves, says Dr. Morisano. The result is often hopelessness. A belief in one's ability to achieve goals is important to building a hopeful attitude. You know, brethren, here's the point. God is working with us as children. But he had to show Peter that Peter's goals were totally unrealistic, totally not in line with reality because he was trying to do it on his own steam. But if he would submit to God in the way that he wanted, in the way that God wanted, he could be a powerful and dynamic leader. Look at Christ's prayer for his disciples. John chapter 17 and verse 9. John chapter 17 and verse, <clears throat> verse 9. You know, Peter, if he was taught a new way to give up his old carnal ways and submit to, to God's program for him, then the sky really was the limit. That's the amazing thing. John chapter 17 and verse 9. Christ's prayer for his disciples. He says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your own name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Verse 15, I pray that you should not take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the world. Keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. <clears throat> Verse 20, Neither do I pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one. Brethren, what an amazing promise. What an amazing prayer that Jesus prayed to the Father. He's talking about us. He's talking about those that would follow after, those that would learn from the testimony of these disciples that we would have the opportunity to be made perfect, to never make mistakes again, to never mess up, to never blow it, to never fall on our face, to always know exactly what to do and how to do it in every situation, to be perfect like God. Doesn't that sound pretty good? And to see Him in His glory which would vaporize, vaporize us if we tried it now. Mr. Meredith talked about that in a recent article from the January, February, Tomorrow's World <clears throat> called, What is the Meaning of Your Life? He says, by working with human beings through his spirit and through allowing all of us to make our mistakes, to go through trials and tests, to try out our own forms of human government, 
education, and religion. We will finally come to the place of total surrender to our Creator and will then, through His Spirit, become fit and ready to have the glorious power of the very Creator as full members of the family of God. We will have spirit bodies. We will never grow tired. We will never get sick. We will never feel discouraged. For we will be glorious spirit beings in the divine family, the creator family of the whole universe. This is the awesome future of those who are willing to totally surrender to their creator and do his will. Brethren, as long as every time we fall, we get back up, we dust ourselves off, we keep going, we can be perfected. We can be glorified. We can be in the family of God. What an amazing destiny we have. Isn't it interesting that Judas wasn't there to hear these last instructions of Jesus Christ that Peter heard? He was on a different wavelength. He was out doing his own thing while Christ was giving precious final instructions to his men. And those instructions were what Peter remembered and what gave him strength and what gave him the perseverance and courage to bounce back from the worst mistake of his life. You know, Proverbs 24 and verse 15 says, Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not his resting place, for a just man falls seven times and rises up again but the wicked shall fall into mischief. When we fall, the main thing is we get back up again and we keep going. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. Paul certainly experienced setbacks in his life, <clears throat> but he kept looking forward and that encouraged him. You know, brethren, as we have trials, as we think about and take inventory of our life, as we are examining ourselves at this Passover time, and we think about our successes, we're encouraged by that, and we also think about the times when we've kind of skinned our knee. What's important? That we learn, we grow, we overcome, and we keep going. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. Paul said, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, not according to my own rules, not according to my own plan, not according to the parameters that I set, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What does examining ourselves in preparation for the Passover do for us? We take inventory, we learn, we grow, so we can go forward, so we can press, if by any means we might attain to the resurrection when Christ returns. You know, brethren, I started the sermon with a question, can you fail well? Well, really, we need to reword that. The question should be, can you bounce back? Can you bounce back? It's really quite an art and skill and learned ability. 
to handle adversity well, to turn setback and problems into opportunities, to learn and grow. As we approach this Passover season, as we examine ourselves, as we fight our personal battles, as we get knocked down from time to time, Let's never forget Christ's final instructions to his disciples that trials and problems happen, that that's part of life. That pruning does not mean rejection. It means God loves us. That help is on the way when we need it. And that we are not alone when God is dwelling in us. And that God has big plans for us beyond our wildest imagination if we can do it his way. Let's remember that our falling down from time to time isn't what's the most important to God. What's more important is how we bounce back. <laughs>